coming together, such an exciting event, and for having me to be part of this. So I'm really enjoying it. Um, in the past few years, my lab has been trying to understand how cells maintain metabolic <coughs> homeostasis in response to environmental cues. And we use two diets as a tool. And one is a calorie restriction, you have heard so much about it. And another one is a high fat diet or Western diet, you like it or not. Um, now, so both of these diets have been linked to interesting biology or pathology. So we're interested in understanding how metabolism regulates physiology. And one part of the physiology we're particularly interested in is stem cell maintenance and tissue homeostasis, and obviously has important implications in aging. We're also interested in understanding how metabolism becomes dysregulated under pathophysiological conditions, such as aging and disease. We use the SIR2 family as a molecular handle to study metabolism. And SIR2 family have emerged as important regulators of metabolism because of its uh, unique enzymatic activity. So SIR2 has a deacetylase activity that is dependent on NAD, which is an important uh, cellular metabolite. And this really links SIR2 activity to metabolic status. In mammals, there are seven SIR2 homologs. Uh, they are localized in different cellular locations. Some are in the nucleus, some are in the, <coughs> some are in the cytosol, and some are in the mitochondria. So today, I will mostly focus on SIR2-3, which is in the mitochondria. Now, for a long time, people thought that during calorie restriction, because we eat less, and therefore, the metabolic rate slows down because we have, we have less food to uh, process. Um, therefore, uh, less loss or reactive oxygen species are produced. So that's why calorie restriction uh, extends lifespan. But in the past number of years, there have been several studies showing that calorie restriction does not slow down metabolic, metabolic rate. If anything, increases metabolic rate. And this has been tested in a number of species, uh, including bees, worms, and mice. Now the question is, if calorie restriction does not slow metabolic rate, now how does calorie restriction reduce oxidative stress? Another related question is, is the reduced oxidative stress essential for the beneficial effects of calorie restriction? We focus on SIR-T3 because it's in the mitochondria, where 90% of ROS are believed to be produced. So the key experiment we did was to put SIR-T3 knockout mice on a calorie restriction diet and measure oxidative damage. So we look at both lipid oxidative damage and protein oxidative damage. Now for wild-type animals, after cow restriction, there's a reduction of oxidative damage. So this has been reported in the literature. However, for 33 knockout animals, this effect was blunted. So this is a really a, a strong evidence suggesting that 33 is required to reduce oxidative stress during cow restriction. Now, how does 33 reduce oxidative stress? So we took a biochemical approach to address that. Now, SOT3 has a deacetylase activity. So one substrate of SOT3 we identified is SOT2, a very critical antioxidant in the mitochondria. Now, without this um, uh, antioxidant, animals simply cannot live. Now, SOT2, not how mice, essentially die right after birth. So we, we found that so, SO2 is a substrate of SO3 and can be deacetylated by SO3, and SO3 can increase the enzymatic activity of SO2. Now this is the in vitro, um, the in vivo of the effect is bigger. We then went ahead and identified the lysine residues on SO2 that are targeted by SO3 for deacetylation. 
Now this is the sequence alignment of the catalytic center of SOC2 from E. coli to humans. Now these two histine residues are at the catalytic center of SOC2. And there are two rising residues adjacent to the catalytic center of SOC2. And when we mutated these two lysine residues, uh, the acetylation level of SOC2 is decreased, and it cannot be further reduced by SOT3. So suggesting that these are the sites that are targeted by SOT3 for the acetylation. And when we mutated these two lysine residues to arginine to mimic the constitutively deacetylated de state of SOC2, this mutant has increased animatic activity. So again, consistent is the idea that the acetylation of SOC2 promotes its enzymatic activity. So this is a simple but interesting experiment. Um, I think it has an interesting implication for people who are interested in aging. Uh, it's a very simple experiment. Uh, we wanted to test the effect of this uh, regulation in cells in vivo. So we overexpressed either SOT3 alone or SOT2 alone or SOT3 and SOT2 in cells and then measure cellular loss levels. Now overexpression of SOT3 reduced the cellular loss by 30%. Overexpression of SOT2, 10%. But if you put these two together, 90%. So at the face value, this is great, consistent with our idea that uh, SOT3 and SOT2 synergistically uh, reduce oxidative stress. But I think it has interesting implications. Now, the free radical theory of aging has been popular for decades, but it's not without controversy. Now, one piece of uh, compelling evidence arguing against this theory is that SOL2 transgenic mice do not have a longer lifespan. Although SOL2 knockout mice die right after birth. So, of course, one way you can explain this data is that free radicals have nothing to do with aging because SOL2 transgenic mice uh, have a normal lifespan. But when I saw uh, our data, our chemical uh, data, um, I thought, well, perhaps another way to explain that data is that if you just only express SOT2 alone, there's only 10% reduction in oxidative stress. And perhaps this 10% reduction is simply not sufficient to be translated into lifespan extension. And perhaps one experiment to do then is to co-express SOT3 and SOT2. And then if we have a sufficient reduction in oxidative stress, and then we can test their lifespan. Or just a thought. Another hypothesis we tested was whether cow restriction reduced oxidative stress by, um, uh, by triggering a metabolic reprogramming, which is from uh, glycolysis to fatty acid oxidation. Now here's the idea. During, um, during glycolysis, if you still remember this in biochemistry class, during glycolysis, for each molecule of SQ-CoA, you get two molecules of NADH. Now during beta oxidation, for each molecule of SQ-CoA, you get one molecule of NADH and one molecule of FADH. And this can make a difference because for NADH, uh, NADH enters the electron transport chain through complex one, but FADH bypasses <coughs> the complex one. And complex one is considered a major site of loss production. So, um, Theoretically, by doing this, like, this metabolic switch to beta oxidation, you can at least partially bypass complex one, and therefore the generation of loss. So we put uh, wild type and SOT3 knockout animals fed a cattle restriction diet in a metabolic chamber and measured the parameter of respiratory exchange ratio. And it's the indication of which fuel the animal is using. Now, if the number is around 1, it means that the animal is using glucose. If it's 0.7, it means the animal is using fatty acid. Now, this is just within one feeding period for this cow-restricted animals. 
Now, for wild type animals, of course, after feeding, they start out with doing glycolysis. Now, six hours later, the, these animals start to switch to beta, uh, beta oxidation. Now, the switch for the non cow animals is delayed for two hours. And we also measure directly the beta oxidation rate in the metabolic tissues of these animals. And again, these animals have a reduced beta oxidation rate. <coughs> At the molecular level, L-cat, which is the enzyme that catalyzes the first step of beta oxidation, is a substrate of sorticinate. And it's, uh, the acidulation status is reduced during cow restriction in wild-type animals, but not the sorticinate non cow animals. And consistently, the enzymatic activity of L-cat is increased during cow restriction in the wild-type, but not sorticinate non cow animals. It seems that there are a number of anti-aging interventions, such as calorie restriction, glucose restriction, and tool inhibition. And they all converge at the level of increasing the metabolic rate and increasing the production of loss. And this, uh, in fact, can trigger a uh, stress resistance uh, program in cells. And we think that SOTI3 perhaps is part of this stress resistance response, and which may have implications in aging. And of course, at this point, we don't know uh, whether SOTI3 is required for lifespan extension uh, during care restriction. But the question is, does it have any physiological relevance? And I have to say, yes, absolutely. Uh, now, before I get into the physiological relevance, and I think these studies have uh, an important implication in metabolic regulation. Now, if you remember in the biochemistry class, we learned that uh, me uh, metabolism or metabolic enzymes are regulated in, uh, in a long-term uh, range. Uh, there's long-term regulation and there's a short-term regulation. In another word, it is regulated either at the transcriptional level or post-translational level, primarily by phosphorylation. Now, studies from my lab and many others have really suggested a new mode of regulation, which is acetylation regulates metabolism. But I think the really uh, interesting and, uh, uh, and striking thing about this regulation is really how prevalent it is. I'll just give you a few examples here. Uh, inside the mitochondria, more than 30% of proteins are acetylated. Now, what's relevant here is that Almost every enzyme in major metabolic pathways is regulated. So this is really striking at just how prevalent it is. And the acetylation status of metabolic enzymes is changed in response to nutritional input. Now, as you can imagine, uh, because this modification is so prevalent, um, it, it can be a very powerful mode to coordinate the directionality and the rate of the metabolic flux. And finally, this mode of regulation is preserved throughout evolution. It can be traced all the way back to the bacteria and is well conserved in humans. Now, in bacteria, one pair of the deacetylase and acetyltransferase are responsible for sensing nutrient and uh, regulating the acetylation status of metabolic enzymes. And this deacetylase is a social homologue. Now, the physiological relevance of this regulation. Um, Tom Krula's lab have found that cattle restriction prevents curing loss, and the mechanism is by SOTIS3 mediated, sorry, is by SOTIS3 mediated reduction of oxidative stress. Another example, uh, or another physiological relevance is cancer. SOTIS3 has been found to be a tumor suppressor and is deleted in at least 40% of uh, human breast cancer samples. And again, the mechanism is by reducing oxidative stress. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one aspect of the physiology my lab is particularly interested in is stem cell maintenance and tissue homeostasis. Now, so the idea is that um, adult stem cells or tissue-specific stem cells 
exist in our tissues throughout our whole life. <coughs> and when we are young, there are sufficient functional stem cells that can keep up with the repair and therefore <coughs> as maintenance of tissue integrity. When we get older, either there are fewer or less functional stem cells that can no longer keep up with the repair and therefore loss of tissue integrity. Now how stem cells age is still an area of intense investigation. So there are um, lots of evidence of this suggesting that oxidative stress is a cause of stem cell aging. Now, first of all, the level of oxidative stress increased with age in hematopoietic stem cells. And there are already a number of MOS models with defective management of oxidative stress, and they all have compromised stem cell function. So these are consistent with the idea that oxidative stress is a cause of uh, stem cell aging. Now the questions we were interested in are the following. Now, oxidative stress increases with age. So how, how do they increase with age? Is it a random passive process or is it a regulated process? Now, the next question is, how does oxidative stress regulate stem cell aging? Is it because of a chronic accumulation of oxidative damage or is it more of acute effect of high level of loss? Uh, in another word, is that a signaling event? And I think it's a very important question because uh, if you think it's a chronic accumulation of oxidative damage throughout life, then it's less likely to be reversible. However, if it's a signaling event, if it's acute effect, then it's more likely to be reversible. So the relevant question here that is, is loss-induced physiological stem cell aging reversible? Now, how does uh, how the loss increase with age? It has been thought that, well, uh, our system never works perfectly, and our electron transport, uh, electron transport chain always produces some free radicals. And these free radicals damage mitochondrial DNA because of proximity, and this damage mitochondrial DNA will lead to more defective mitochondrial electron transport chain and therefore increased production of loss. So if you will, it's a vicious circle. So um, you think this way then, it's more or less a random and passive process, so it's not regulated. Uh, in my lab, we use hematopoietic stem cells as a model to study stem cell aging. Now, hematopoietic stem cells, um, just like other stem cells that have the capacity to self-renewal to give rise to themselves, and it can differentiate to give rise to the entire blood system. Now with aging, um, the self-renewal capacity of stem cells are compromised, and they also have a differentiation defect. They, are, um, they, differentiate, they have a, a skewed differentiation towards the myeloid lineage, so if you widely divide it. So, so uh, broadly speaking, hematopoietic stem cells can divide and uh, can differentiate into the myeloid lineage and the lymphoid lineage. Now, aged uh, hematopoietic stem cells tend to, different, uh, tend to differentiate towards the myeloid lineage, and this will in fact have some important clinical implications uh, because childhood leukemia tend to be of a lymphoid origin, and leukemias that arise from it. Uh, old people tend, tend to be of a minority lineage. So we first look at the expression of SOTI3 in the hematopoietic system. And SOTI3 is highly expressed in uh, hematopoietic stem cells and the, pro and the progenitors. But in differentiated hematopoietic cells, the, the level is very low. So we were pretty hopeful that it's doing something in the stem cells. So we took a genetic approach and examined the, the number and function of hematopoietic stem cells in SOTI3 novel animals. But to our surprise, no difference. So they have the same number of hematopoietic stem cells and they have the same functional capacity. So this was done by the gold standard for <coughs> marrow transplantation. So what's going on? Well, uh, because one major function of SOTI3 is to reduce oxidative stress. So we thought, well, perhaps SOTI3 uh, only plays a role when cells are under stressed conditions. So how can we stress the cells? 
Now, hematic black stem cells have this remarkable ability to self-renewal. So you can take um, the bone marrow from the donor and transplant it then into the recipients. And then you can take the bone marrow from the recipients and then use them as a donor for the next round of transplantation. So this can be repeated several times. Now after the first transplant and the second transplant, there's a mild increase in cellular loss level in hematopoietic stem cells. But after the third transplant, there's a dramatic increase in the cellular loss level. Okay. So we use this as a model to stress hematopoietic stem cells. So we did this experiment using wild type and CD3 knockout. So after the first transplant, there's no difference in the constitution in the transplant experiment. And after the second transplant, there's no difference. But after the third transplant, we saw reduction for CD3 knockouts. So another stress is aging. So with age, cellular loss level also increases. So we, uh, we look at aged well type and CD3 knockout lines. And again, we saw um, reduced hematopoietic stem cell numbers in CD3 knockout animals and reduced reconstitution of bone marrow transplantation. Now, what this data suggests is that so what CD3 does is really to regulate the stress response in hematopoietic stem cells. And we also found that uh, the expression of CD3 in fact decreases with age. So this may in fact contribute to increased loss level in metabolic, in age metabolic stem cells. So many two minutes. Okay. Then the next question is, if we reintroduce CD3 back into aged hematopoietic stem cells, which has a lower CD3 level, is that sufficient to uh, rescue the functional capacity of aged stem cells? So we did that experiment, and in a couple of uh, functional assays, we showed that overexpression of CD3 in aged hematopoietic stem cells uh, can improve their functional capacity. This includes the um, gold standard bone marrow transplantation. Now just to summarize this, uh, so what we are showing here is really in contrast to this random passive process uh, that causes the increase of oxidative stress with age. Instead, what we are showing here is that it's a much uh, a regulated process. And we think that the, the suppression of SOT3 and the suppression of this, uh, this stress resistant program may in fact contribute to increased oxidative stress with age. And more importantly, uh, SOT3 overexpression can in fact rescue the functional defect of age stem cells and really suggesting that the effects of oxidative stress on stem cell aging is acute and reversible. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Kate Brown and Shelley Chewing and Ron for the work. And we collaborated with Eric Burden at UCSF for CD3 and James Scanlon at Harvard for uh, hand-like stem cells. Thank you.